welcome to session three. We hope that you're already finding this course useful and that you've had some really good conversations since last time. We always find session two really helpful for our own marriage. I had been meaning to book that hotel for weeks and just hadn't quite got round to it. Our conversation certainly helped me realise just how much it meant to Scylla and so I apologise to her and next time I'll try to do it before Scylla reminds me. And uh, I haven't told her this yet, but I did manage to book a room in that hotel you wanted to go to. Yay! <laughs> I'm really excited. That is fantastic. <laughs> this session, we're going to be looking at how to resolve conflict. What do you think causes the most arguments in marriage? We asked various people on the streets what they thought, and here are their answers. I think most couples have silly fights about absolutely everything. Not one thing in particular, probably everything that there is, they fight about. Because you spend a lot of time with someone when you're in a relationship. Most couples probably argue about uh, money. 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 Finance. Money. 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 Yeah, I think it's money too. I think most couples argue about money. And affairs and cheating and going out and uh, sex and things like that. La jalousie. Jealousy. Being selfish. Mostly it's tiny little things. It's rubbish little things like, I haven't done the washing up again. It's my turn to cook, that kind of stuff. Children, if you have children, sharing responsibility. Children. Yeah, yeah. With, with kids you get tired, so you we get just tired, you the... get ratty, and mm. if you have a bad day at work, you get tired if she's had a bad day at home. It's, you know, it's just life pressures, I think. Responsibilities, I guess. Sharing work. Work, definitely. Maybe they don't have the same goals. I think the person who is least stubborn should just always give in. <laughs> give in and say, if it's a silly fight, it's a silly fight. Just walk out of it, I suppose. Walk out of the house. Go down the pub and then come back. <laughs> I prefer to be honest and deal with it and try and deal with it straight away, so it's done and dusted. There's a little piece of advice, is never sleep on them. I smash few plates. I always uh, use those cracked ones. I never do the, I never would smash a good plate. And then feel better afterwards. <laughs> We've been collecting stories from the press around the world about arguments between couples. Here are a few of them. Apparently, police were called to a house in Georgia, USA, after a woman knocked her husband out with a potato. <laughs> the pair had started to argue in the kitchen on the morning of Thanksgiving. She told police she hadn't meant to hit her husband. <laughs> a man in India has reportedly spent half a century living in a tree after a tiff with his wife. The Mumbai Mirror reported Mr Parida, aged 83, saying he'd taken to staying in a mango tree after a quarrel over a tiny issue. He moved trees when his first tree was destroyed in a storm, but he's never <laughs> moved back into his house. <laughs> A man in northern Italy who was sentenced to nine months house arrest for breaching immigration regulations begged a judge to jail him instead because he couldn't stand his wife's nagging. He said, I need some peace. The local court agreed to his request. <laughs> a British couple called Frank and Anita Milford, who'd been married for 78 years, revealed the secret of their long marriage. Frank, aged 98, said... We don't always see eye to eye and have a small argument every day. But that comes and goes. We're always here for each other. Disagreement is inevitable and normal in every marriage. In fact, it's healthy. Every couple will face conflict. Conflict doesn't mean that we've married the wrong person or that the relationship is doomed to failure. Rather, with the right tools, resolving conflict can strengthen the relationship. Boy, conflict is tough. I think of any of the weeks of this course, that was the hardest mm -hmm. course to get through, and it's the one when we revisit, it kind of brings up conflict. It's still a struggle. It is a struggle. We had a lot of conflict before, before the course, and uh, in fact, we were conflicted about just taking the course. Um, and it did help to give us some tools to make the conflict resolution a more productive process. We still argue, um, but I think it's less finger pointing 
and and it and we're able to come to the table and say this is what happened here and you hurt my feelings I, I don't understand and why were my feelings not first and foremost for you because they're first and foremost for me and it does it has helped a lot we're not perfect at it but we're better than we were why is conflict inevitable the main reason is we're all different our different backgrounds different desires different priorities different personalities means we'll perceive things differently and we won't necessarily always agree added to that we're all naturally very self-centered we find it easier to focus on my desires, my opinions and my needs, rather than on those of our husband or wife. Conflict is destructive when we try to force or manipulate our partner into doing things our way, when we see ourselves as being on opposite sides. Because really, in our marriage, we're on the same side, the same team. It's a bit like doing the three-legged race. At first, when we're tied together, it feels awkward and difficult. Our strides are different lengths and we set off at different times. It's an art to run with someone else and needs lots of practice. You've got to think about the other person. But if you get into a rhythm, if you learn to match your strides to each other, that feeling of running in harmony with someone else is really satisfying. In marriage, we have to work through problems together, with both of us asking, are there ways that I need to change for the sake of our partnership? That's how we match our strides to each other. So, what's required to work together to resolve conflict effectively? First of all, we need to express our appreciation of each other on a regular basis. No marriage can survive a lack of respect, a lack of positive, affirming words being spoken to each other. We all need encouragement. But that's not always obvious, even to our partner. When we had our first kid, I had a job that was super demanding and I didn't have time all the time. I'd come home after these grinding days at work and then in my mind, I'm just like looking at my day and, and I get home and she's like unloading on me, just like and I'm, I'm just like getting the door like, I need time. When he comes home, I want to talk to him and I want to have a conversation with him because having a conversation with a three-year-old all day is it's fine, but it's, you know, you need the adult interaction and, you know, show me attention, love and affection. I just tell them, like, I need this. You need to tell me I look nice or that my cooking tastes good. I just, I need you to just fill me up a little bit. This need for encouragement is just as great for men as for women. We have to make our husband or wife feel like the most important person in the world for us. In that way, we build up their confidence. Mark Twain once said, I can live for two months on a sincere compliment. Appreciation is the opposite of criticism. Most couples, when they're going out, tend to say a lot of positive things to each other. But in marriage, it's all too easy to focus on what irritates us instead. I know for myself, I find it really annoying when Scylla leaves the sink full of dirty water overnight so that the grease has congealed around the edge by the morning. <laughs> and it infuriates me that Nicky has a tendency to keep everything, even when it's broken. He says that these things just might come in useful one day. But as far as I'm concerned, it seems like junk and I'm longing to get rid of it. From our own experience, we also find that the more we concentrate on the things we like about each other, the more inwardly appreciative we become of each other. Focusing on what we like and admire about our partner needs to be something we practice on a daily basis, a habit we get into. I remember one man saying to us, I told my wife on our wedding day that I loved her and I'd let her know if the situation changed. It hasn't. <laughs> But she complains that I don't tell her about my feelings for her. Well, I'm not surprised she complains. <laughs> <laughs> Professor John Gottman, a psychologist who's been analysing the habits of married couples for over 30 years, says he reckons he's able to tell within the first five minutes of listening to and watching a couple whether or not their relationship is in trouble. And he says a key indicator is, are they showing each other appreciation? And his advice to couples is this, by simply reminding yourself of your partner's positive qualities, even as you grapple with each other's flaws, you can prevent a happy marriage from declining. 
I think another conflict that we have is the lack of appreciation you feel. I think Curtis, even though that we work together, my job requires more of office time. So he's at home, you know, when he's not running, doing, you know, stuff for the business, he's at home and he does the cooking, he does the cleaning, he does the laundry, he does, he does everything. So that has a tendency to make him feel extremely unappreciative from both, both of me and my son. That's stressful for him. I think you need to appreciate each other in order for the marriage to grow and build over time that you don't take them for granted. And you, you also know. have to remind them. Yeah. You have to be your, yeah. their accountability you partner yep. and try to remind them of, hey, you know, you're, this is how I feel. Um, you know, I'm feeling unappreciative or I'm feeling unheard. We now want you to do an exercise that you'll see in the manual entitled Showing Appreciation. We suggest that you fill in six things that you appreciate about your husband or wife. And it may be thanking them for what they do, or it may be telling them how much you value them for who they are. And try and make it a mixture. When you've both finished, show each other what you've written. And one tip, it's well worth coming up with six if you possibly can. <laughs> We'd encourage you to look back once in a while to read again what you wrote down about each other in that exercise. When we show our gratitude for each other's positive qualities, we're much more likely to work together as a team. The next requirement for resolving conflict effectively is to identify and accept our differences. Trying to make our husband or wife think and behave like us or to fit our image of what we think they should be like, never works. We can be very different in all sorts of ways, such as how we make decisions. One of us may be more cautious and careful, taking a long time over every decision, while the other makes decisions quickly and easily and doesn't worry about making mistakes. We had our second kid, so we had to, she had a really small car, so we had to get a family-sized car. I loved it. I was kind of in charge of buying the car and I like did all my analysis and I knew exactly what I was getting into and we had this day, it was like the car buying day and I, we were wheeling and dealing and hustling all around town and like she was ready like the first place we went, yeah, let's just do it. He wanted to do the negotiations. I, on the other hand, would have taken a number and been like, sure, like here's a check. You can, yeah, have as much as you want. Like just give me the car and let's go. So it's just an example because I think she's like a quick decision maker. You know, I enjoy talking to the people and, you know, and so I think it was kind of, I don't know, just an example of a couple of things that came out in our different styles. We can be very different in how much planning we like to do. One of us may be very well organized, planning well in advance, while the other likes to be more spontaneous and prefers to go with the flow. That's me. Uh, as you heard from our discussion in the last session, I like to keep my options open as long as possible, just in case I come up with a better idea or find a cheaper deal. <laughs> to me, that's procrastination. Whereas I prefer to be more organised and know what we're going to do. We can also be very different in how we restore our energy. For an extrovert, that will include spending time with others. So, on a Friday evening after a hard day's work, an extrovert might think, what an awful day at work. Thank goodness we're going out to see people tonight. An introvert would probably think the exact opposite. And if they're exhausted on a Friday night, they're more likely to look forward to a quiet weekend and may feel very differently about social occasions. I'm an extrovert, so I prefer to go out and do things with other couples. Joe is very much an introvert and would prefer just the two of us to go out to dinner. Uh, so we try to balance uh, how much socializing we do with other folks. It's really hard for me when we're going for a date night is, okay, what time are we going to be home? I mean, that's because I'm uh, an introvert and I feel, feel much better at home. If we had a date night at home, that'd be awesome. And I know she really likes to get out and be around people and go to shows and be and have discussions with multiple groups and for me, I, I like the one-on-one -on -one time. Joe asks us, while we're backing out of the driveway, what time are we getting home? 
That's, that's how introverted he is. <laughs> and who do I have to talk to? <laughs> see, well, we haven't even left yet, so let's just see what happens. <laughs> do I like these people or not? <laughs> There's a lot of that. Another difference between the extrovert and introvert is that extroverts tend to think out loud, while introverts like to sort out their thoughts first and then speak. I'm married to an extrovert. Uh, I've had to learn not to react too quickly when Scylla says something to me with great passion and conviction. She's quite likely to change her mind and say the opposite five minutes later uh, with equal passion and conviction. <laughs> As an introvert, I like to work out what I think before speaking. So, if we have a difficult decision, I'll typically go away by myself to think it through and then tell Scylla what I think. <laughs> but to me, that's not a discussion. That's just his conclusion. <laughs> In marriage, we have to learn to accept our varying approaches. With personality differences, one attitude is not better or worse than another. It's just different. A strong marriage is where we see ourselves as a partnership, combining our strengths and helping each other in our weaknesses. As couples, we're not just different in terms of our personalities. Other things have shaped us and made us who we are. Our upbringing and our parents' attitudes would have affected how we behave and how we think. And we can come into marriage with different values in all sorts of areas. Often, we find that opposites attract. We can be intrigued by and drawn towards someone who has different qualities to ourselves. But then, the very differences that initially attracted us can start to annoy us. So, often it's the small things, our partner's particular ways of doing things, that can start to irritate us. Brad really likes things to be very clean. He's a high standard of cleanliness in our home. And I do it. I mean, I'm, I'm the one who, it's yeah. not like I'm like sitting back like, hey, clean everything up. Yeah. It's like, he I like to maintain it, it that way, but then when tornadoes come through and, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a lot of conflict over this issue, honestly. Yeah. Um, and which- and part of it's OCD, I'm sure, yeah. on my part. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I'm like, I'm not a slob, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I was kind of very, defend being very defensive and halfway through, I, I kind of had this like mental shift of this is not going to go away. Like this is something that's a difference between us. It's always been a difference between us. You know, mm -hmm. how can we live with this? Like how are we going to make this work for us? So my solution was <laughs> I'm not going to do anything for a whole month and then we'll see how this place that looks. That was his solution. <laughs> and I was like, that's not a good and solution. And it was passive aggressive, but <laughs> I still, I thought it was pretty. That was prior to the mental shift. Yes, that was prior to her mental shift. <laughs> An example of a major difference between Scylla and me is in the area of money, as we know it is for many couples. By and large, there are three choices we can make with money. We can save it, spend it, or give it away. Uh, Scylla and I have had no problem agreeing on how much and when we should give money away, but with the other two options, we are poles apart. I suppose that I'd describe myself as a natural saver. Well, I'm more of a natural spender. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. That doesn't mean that I'm a compulsive shopper, nor does it mean I enjoy shopping any more than Nikki. It's just that I find it easier to spend money than Nikki does. In fact, much easier. <laughs> <laughs> and that led to a, a lot of conflict in the early years of our marriage, with me feeling resentful and Scylla feeling rather guilty. But we eventually came to realise it's not that either of us is better with money than the other. It's just that we're better at different things. Nikki is much better at managing money than me. And Scylla is much better at using it. Uh, 30 years on, I think we've learned how we complement each other. Uh, Scylla certainly helped me not to be overcautious and to use money a lot more freely. Uh, as an example of how overcautious I can be, uh, for their weekly pocket money, our children used to have one penny for each year of their age. Sixpence when they were six, eightpence when they were eight, and so on. Uh, that was quite a while ago, but still, Kirsty, when she was ten, would have had to save up for a whole month to buy even one ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> well, eventually, Scylla persuaded me that tenpence was never going to teach our daughter a lot about handling money sensibly and their pocket money was raised by a thousand percent overnight. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, 
Nikki definitely helps me to keep account and not to overspend. If I was running short of money in the past, I used to bury my head in the sand. I just didn't want to think about it and would often run into debt. Nikki helps me to plan ahead. Understanding each other's strengths and weaknesses helps us work much better as a team. You know, the difference in attitudes to money is something which really explodes sometimes in the early years of a marriage. He's from the background where just anything goes and, hey, live today because tomorrow you might be dead. But she's been from a frugal background, you know, and she, and she watches every penny. And, and it can be really, really kind of uh, uh, difficult, I, I think. The truth of it is, as the years go by, you have to let each other know how you feel. And normally, one is not right and the other wrong, because it can be really boring to watch every penny, can't it? And really frustrating to see every penny going out of the window. So you have to talk about it. And in truth, there's no right way for every couple. But normally, you get to a stage where you say, look, we've got this amount of money and we ought to try to live within our means. The fascinating thing about debt is it's no respect of income. So we think, when I've got that rise coming through next month, life's going to be fine. But normally, we've spent up to it within a few months. Most people spend about 10% more than they earn. So when couples have a different attitude to money, I recommend they talk about it, sit down, do a budget, and agree what you're going to spend on a car, on holidays, on restaurants, on a thousand and one different things. And then the others have got the right to say, you stepped over our line. And it's very important they've agreed it together. If you've never done a budget, you'll find some notes on how to go about it in the back of the marriage book. This need to appreciate our different strengths and support each other's weaknesses applies to all areas of life. And that's the point of this next exercise, which we've called recognising your differences. First of all, against the list of issues, each of you, put your own and your partner's initial, where you consider you each come on the line between those two extremes. You'll see the examples for Nikki and myself regarding money. I'm more towards the spending end of the spectrum, while Nikki's closer to the saving end. And punctuality. I like to leave lots of time to catch a plane or a train, whereas Nikki prefers to cut it fine very fine, actually, <laughs> as he feels getting there early is a waste of time. Now, don't look at what your husband or wife has put until you've both finished. Then discuss where your differences can be a source of strength in your relationship. We hope you enjoyed that last exercise and were able to laugh at some of your differences. We found that laughing and teasing each other kindly keeps us connected and is a great way of diffusing tension. Maintaining a sense of humour is such an important part of working as a team. For many couples, when they start going out, laughter is a big part of their relationship. In marriage, continuing to laugh at each other's funny ways of doing things prevents us from taking ourselves too seriously and stops our relationship becoming intense. It's nice to have a partner to look at each other and laugh about what our kids are doing. You know, 10 years in, we start to have inside jokes about stuff we did when we were dating. And... When I can make Ben laugh, I feel like, oh, well, that was good. <laughs> but it happens, I mean, it happens more often than I think it will. We want to go on now to look at what is probably the heart of this session, a key skill in marriage for resolving conflict effectively, and that is learn to negotiate. People approach conflict differently. Some try to force their partner to do things their way. Other people surrender. They may be frightened of disagreements. They may hide, run away or just do anything to avoid confrontation. Still other people bargain. They say, I'll do this if you do that. But that all too easily becomes, I won't do my bit because you haven't done your bit. None of these approaches builds closeness or is effective in resolving conflict. However, there is a way that is effective and that's through negotiation. 
Negotiation involves discussing the issue that's causing tension and finding a solution that works for us as a couple. It means seeing, as we said earlier, that really we're on the same side and working together as a team. We're going to run through six very practical steps for negotiating areas of conflict effectively. Six steps that bring peace between us. The first step is to find the best time. I think we all recognise that there are bad times to try and resolve arguments. When I'm at work, I need to be 100% focused on that and can't be resolving conflict in the middle of a day. For me, the bad timing is before I go to work, when I come home from work, or during work, and that seems to be his favorite time. Yeah. He's learning to balance that, and it's still a challenge for us, but I think the ultimate goal is to set that time aside once the girls are asleep, once we've had that family time, um, to talk about it one-on-one. -on -one. Other bad times are in front of other people, uh, just before a special occasion, when we're about to leave for work in the morning, or when we've just walked in through the door at the end of a busy day. But the number one worst time for most couples is late at night. When we're tired, we can so easily get things out of perspective. I think one thing that the marriage course illuminated for us was timing to talk through things. Joe is very much early to bed. Anytime after 8 p.m., he's winding down and just doesn't have the energy to deal with uh, any kind of discussion of heavy topics. Yeah, I think my boys call it the pumpkin hour between eight and nine because at nine o'clock I turn into a pumpkin <laughs> and they would purposely wait until I went to bed and then they'd come and lay across the bed on top of me, talk to me, talk to me, <laughs> and it was, it was pretty funny, but. And I am not a morning person, so if he greets me in the morning with, we've got to talk about this, that usually doesn't go too well. So usually late afternoon, early evening, when we're both home from work, we've had dinner, that's a good time for us to be able to talk through things. In the early days of our marriage, our most futile arguments were always last thing at night. We'd find ourselves totally losing the plot. And then, very helpfully, some friends told us about what they called the 10 o'clock rule. The rule is that if you're having an argument late in the evening, either one of you can call the 10 o'clock rule into play. That means the argument has to be postponed until a better time. Perhaps earlier the next evening or over a cup of coffee at the weekend. And that was such a help for us, and we've often used the 10 o'clock rule over the years. Actually, it's usually Nikki who calls it into play. Uh, of course, waiting for a better time takes self-discipline. I'm naturally more volatile than Nikki, and that does have its healthy side, getting things out into the open. But I've come to realize that it isn't always helpful to let Nikki know straight away when I disagree with him. And learning self-discipline has been a difficult and big part for me of resolving conflict more effectively. Using the 10 o'clock rule doesn't mean going to bed still angry with each other. The issue may not be resolved, but if either or both of us have said unkind things, we need to apologise to and forgive each other and reassure each other that our relationship is still OK, even though we haven't yet reached agreement. We'll be talking more about dealing with anger in the next session. So, the first step is to find the best time. The second step is to identify the issue. Arguments so easily get widened and all sorts of other things get drawn in. So sometimes we can't even remember what it was that we were arguing about in the first place. Identifying and articulating the issue can be the most important part of preventing disagreements escalating. An analogy that we found very helpful is to imagine that we're on a three-seater sofa with wife at one end and husband at the other, with this contentious issue right in between us, keeping us apart and stopping us from hearing each other properly or seeing each other's perspective. Identifying the issue means taking what's coming between us and putting it out in front of us. Then, as wife and husband, we can move together on the sofa with nothing between us and work together on finding a solution for the issue that's out in front of us. 
one of the tools that we learned was to put the problem out in front of us and not have it come between us. And that is extremely helpful because when you put it between us, you look at the person and you see the issue. When you put it out in front of you, there's the issue and you're coming from different vantage points, but you're trying to come to a commonality of let's solve this and come to you know some type of happy medium here. As a team, pushing the problem out, we're, you're not focused on what you're, what, I'm not focused on what Jenny's doing. We're looking together at the aspects of the problem that we're trying to resolve as a team. We're on the same side and we're trying to fix it, you know, whatever the problem might be. The third step is to discuss the issue rather than attack each other. If we're to do this, it may well involve some of us having to learn to control our temper. Uncontrolled anger is very destructive and tragically can cause people to become physically violent, which almost certainly will destroy a marriage. And if you know uncontrolled anger is a problem in your marriage, we would strongly suggest that you seek help. It's also destructive to hurl accusations at each other in the heat of an argument. I remember one of the things was what causes you to not come to your spouse when you have a problem and and there was a list one of them said you're scared that you're going to create conflict or you're going to make your spouse mad and and I, that's really hit home i wouldn't bring something up that made me you know angry or sad or uncomfortable to him because i didn't want to make him mad i mean i would rather her just say it i guess but she didn't want to trigger my reaction it just wasn't healthy for us so you know i'm again it's easier said than done right so it's it's not like you know, where we've totally fixed it, but you know, it highlighted it and I'm aware of it and now we can talk about those things, so. The vicar who married Nikki and me gave us a great bit of advice. He said, there are two phrases to avoid using at all costs in marriage. You always <laughs> and you never. Because when we use one of these phrases, we're labeling each other's character, such as when we say, you never do anything to help or you always make us late. A much better way of putting it is to use I statements describing our own feelings. So rather than you never do anything to help, it's much more productive to say, I'm upset you didn't help me with the clearing up last night. Or instead of you always make us late, it's better to say, I don't like leaving for the train so late because it makes me feel really stressed. Equally important to avoid attacking or blaming each other is to be a good listener, as we talked about on session two. When we're having an argument, we're usually very keen our partner understands our point of view, but we're not quite so keen to understand theirs. Making sure we listen will be especially relevant for us if we know that we're better with words than our husband or wife. A simple but very effective ground rule is take it in turns to talk. When conflict would arise from a breakdown of communication, like needing to be heard or thought we were being heard and not being heard, the next level of that conflict can rise to uh, an outburst. And sometimes that outburst starts with the wrong words. And how we choose our words can mm -hmm. set the tone for how mm -hmm. resolving that conflict is going to go. Mm -hmm. And um, we got into these habits of where an incident may have happened once, but it was prefaced by the word, you always do this. And there's, there's no way I always do anything. <laughs> <laughs> but I might have done something wrong that one time, but to me, that would feel like I'm a bad person. So um, we had to reset the way that we said things to one another. The fourth step is to work out possible solutions. Now this may sound unrealistic in the middle of a heated discussion, but once you've done the first three steps that we've just mentioned, it's much more mm. possible. When we start focusing on the issue, it's amazing how many ideas we can come up with. So, for example, if the conflict is over money, some possible solutions may be you make a detailed annual budget together or you change who organizes the finances. We got married late in life. I was 43 years old, so I'd always been independent. I had my own credit cards, whatever. So even for me coming into marriage at that point in life, I wanted that financial independence. We were both doing pretty well, and the housing crash happened, which kind of wiped me out. We were now found in a position where we weren't equals anymore financially. 
And we had let six years go by with not even mm -hmm. addressing mm -hmm. who's mm -hmm. in charge of what. Mm -hmm. But what was happening is in tough times, and I could barely pay the bills, I was going through all the stress and anxiety, but I did not bring it to him because with him not being able to earn as much money, or I didn't want to make it worse for him and hurt his feelings. All I created was him not knowing where we were financially, and that built some frustration. It pushed our intimacy away, a lot of things, because it, it really can build resentment. So after discussing this, we kind of learned that my strengths and Deanna's strengths mm -hmm. were actually different in this area. Um, I was more of the planner, the budgeter, and the administrator mm -hmm. to how mm -hmm. uh, the, the finance would go. And Deanna was more focused on her job and trying to get more to satisfy mm -hmm. the difference. Mm -hmm. But both of those issues were on her back because she was actually paying the bills at the same time. So we had to recalibrate mm -hmm. and, and sit down and create a budget. I think it's incredible when you really come together, and I think for men and women, don't feel you're losing your independence, but you're really gaining an advocate and somebody's gonna help you to sort of move through life. Other possible solutions to a conflict over money could be one or both of you decide to use cash rather than cards, or you agree to sit down once a week to review spending, or perhaps you decide to ask for help from someone who's good with money. Sometimes it helps to write down a list of possible solutions to see the different possibilities and we can then refer back to them if necessary. The fifth step is to decide on the best solution for now. Try it out. See if it works for your marriage. If it works, the issue will stop causing conflict. It was just coming into our first Thanksgiving mm -hmm. and at Thanksgiving you know, you had the turkey. I think it might have been the day before Thanksgiving. Yeah. I was like, hey, babe, so where's the turkey? My family had grown up where my dad always cooked the turkey on a grill, really bizarre, and my mom had always done all the sides. And, and for so me, was... it was my grandma who always cooked everything. So we came into our relationship with this, I guess, this rule system that yeah, was at Thanksgiving, realize. you know. I was like, the guy does it. He's I'm like, supposed to do it for it. her, and, and she's all supposed it. to do it for me. Yeah. And so, we actually it got pretty heated in that moment yeah. because we were like, because it was something very small. Mm -hmm. But at that very moment, Wendy was like, oh, hang on a second. My dad always cooked it. Your grandma always cooked it. So what are we going to do? How are yeah. we going to figure this out? <laughs> so, yeah. you know, what's amazing is now I figure out how to go buy a turkey at Thanksgiving mm -hmm. now and yeah. how to prepare it and dress it and yeah. cook it. And decide. Yes. Well, so now after doing it a few times, we've had very successful yeah. Thanksgivings. Silly, but yeah. we've compromised in that I do the turkey, mm -hmm. she does everything else. The sixth and final step is be prepared to reevaluate if there still seems to be conflict over the issue. Go back to the other possible solutions and try another one. It's very freeing mm -hmm. if we both accept that the solution we've tried doesn't need to be set in stone. We can try something different if the first one we came up with isn't working. Those six steps, finding the best time, putting the issue out in front of us, listening to each other's point of view, looking for solutions together, trying one out to see if it works and trying another if it doesn't have really helped us when there's been tension between us. It's time now for our feature couple for this session, who are going to talk about their differences and how they deal with them. Here we go. Yeah, my bundles. Oh, quickly, quickly. I'll get it for you. I'll get it for you. You go upstairs. Yeah. At bedtime, Harry said to Mum, I like the videos, but I like my... I'm Henrik. And I'm Inger. <laughs> We've been married 11 years. We have two children, both of them three years. Later, Nan took Harry back. We went on the marriage course eight years ago now. We had been married for three years at that stage, and things were going pretty well, but we wanted to find a way of making it even better. One of the sessions that really stood out for us um, was the session on differences. One could say that we are probably different in almost every area you could, you could come up with. I like to save my money. And I like to spend it. I'm sporty. And I'm arty. I'd love to spend holidays on our own. And I want to socialize with our friends and our family. I like to read. And I like to talk. I like to go to bed really early. And I want to go to bed at 1am in the morning. I do not like to cook a recipe. And I cook by the boat. 
And when we argue, I retreat. And I'm the one who attacks. Funnily enough, eight years on since doing the course, we realised that we've become much more similar and the edges have been softened. And I've been known to stay up quite late and talk. And I cooked a meal without using a recipe. Another thing that we found helpful on that session was um, finding an us solution. There's a one classic example where um, we were renovating a kitchen. I like really light birch type uh, cabinets. And I really wanted antique stained dark wood um, cabinets. Which is the worst for me. And, and birch was absolutely something I could not consider ever. Should I kind of sacrifice my idea of, of the dark wood and, and, and go for birch even though I hate it? Or do you compromise? Do you do um, one birch cabinet, one dark stained, one birch, one dark stained? We had to think of something. So like good Swedes, we went to Ikea. And there we found a solution that was just us. As you can um, see that this kind of light um, white painted uh, look that kind of ticked the box for Henrik because they were light and they ticked the box for me because they, they had an old feel, old look to them. Um, and that was an amazing moment for us. It's, it's been one of those um, situations that you can go back to and you can say we found an us solution then so surely we can find one again. The most important realization was that it's not all bad to be different. I think it was easy in the beginning to look at those differences as dangerous, that they were potentially tearing us apart. And what the course taught us was that differences aren't dangerous. Our differences might mean that you know, we can complement each other. But it also means that we need to, to understand the differences and then try to find solutions that work for both of us. But I think what we learned about about um, listening to each other, you know, letting the other one explain where they're coming from. That has really been the key in uh, finding a strength in, in those differences and finding a way for us to resolve um, issues that pop up between us. This whole process of resolving conflict through negotiation involves each of us considering how we might need to change. It's no good saying, that's just the way I am, while being critical of our husband or wife. Jesus once said on this subject, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in someone else's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to remove the speck from the other person's eye. In marriage, our attitude needs to be, we can change ourselves, we can't change each other. Most husbands and wives want the, their partners to change in some way, don't they? She says, I wish he was better at DIY. Uh, he says, I wish he was sexier. I wish he was stronger with the children. But the problem is, when you try to change somebody, you often try to make them into somebody they just can't be. Uh, and when you do that, you miss the person they are. The truth is you can't really change another person, but you can change yourself. You can say, I am going to stop being sarcastic. I am going to be more positive. I'm going to tell my husband and my wife I love them every day, and I'm going to change. And because change is dynamic, often that affects the other person as well. Sometimes couples break up because they think they're incompatible and there's nothing that they can do about it. Mm. And that's so sad. We're not incompatible unless we refuse to change, unless we refuse to match our stride to our husband or wife. But we can only change when we know what matters to each other. Sometimes the real issues are buried under years of unresolved conflict, or we've never told each other about what frustrates and hurts us. We can't assume our partner automatically knows. Mm. We must tell each other about the issues that matter most to us and why they're important to us. Requesting change of each other in marriage is a good thing. Demanding change is harmful. 
So much conflict in marriage arises from our subconscious assumptions about the ways things should be done, whether it's the way we parent our children, the way we decorate our house, what sort of holidays we take, or the way we approach money. These assumptions are mainly the result of our different upbringings and the values that we've taken on from our parents, our step-parents, or whoever brought us up. The more aware we are of our own and each other's values, the more allowances we'll make for our different views, and the easier we'll find it to make changes for the sake of our marriage. As a result of very fierce arguments, my father would walk out quite a bit. Now, maybe he was doing it because he didn't want it to escalate, but he would walk out. My father walked out as a way of coping, dealing with it. And when Sandy walked out on me, I totally felt abandoned. And I couldn't handle that because I felt like I was living all over again, my dad walking out. And this is the man that I was relying on and trusting in. So we learned very quickly that that's not a healthy yeah, way to know. handle problems. Denise let me know how she felt about that. And, and I realized that that wasn't gonna work either that just walking out didn't solve anything, which is different from saying in the midst of a, a conflict, yeah, hold on, I need 15 minutes, I need 30 minutes, I need an hour to, and then let's come back. That's different than just walking out. The next exercise will help you to understand why you each react in certain ways to certain situations which may be causing conflict between you. Nikki and I did this exercise ourselves recently and it was very revealing. Actually, we had a big argument. <laughs> but it helped us to recognize some differences between our fathers that have caused tensions between us over the years. I had a father who was very practical and had an extraordinary gift for mending anything and everything. As a result, I don't worry very much about things breaking as I think that mending them is a normal part of life. So I was very happy driving around in our old car, even though it was quite likely to break down at any moment. My dad, on the other hand, had totally different gifts. He wasn't at all practical and had no confidence that he could mend anything. So he always wanted to be sure that the car was in really good working order. And doing this exercise made me realize I've taken on that same value which is why having an old car that was always breaking down caused a lot of tension and arguments between us. We had to look for a solution. And after some discussion, we decided the best thing was to change our car for one in much better condition. And life is happier all round, as the thought of going somewhere in the car doesn't make Scylla feel stressed anymore. We want you to turn in your manuals to the next exercise called matching our strides. And first of all, circle the words or the phrases that best describe your feelings about money and possessions as you grew up. And then add other words or phrases that come to mind. Show each other what you've put, and then after that, agree on the list of values that are most important to you as a couple in your approach to money and possessions. Finally, write down any action points or changes that you'd both like to make. We know that for some of you, it'll take longer to find solutions than you've got time for. So you may have to continue for your homework. Work, we've put a similar exercise to help you work out your fundamental values regarding other issues that commonly cause conflict, such as how you spend your free time, how you divide up the chores at home, or different models for parenting if you have children. I think different styles of parenting can really cause conflict in, in, in a marriage. It happened in, a, in our own marriage, actually, um, particularly with our testing child. Katie was our first. She was compliant, so no problem there. But then Lloyd came into the world. Lloyd used to, to wake up every day of his life thinking, how can I drive my mother crazy today? And he'd go to bed worried he'd not made a good job of that task. 
And I'd have watched Diane with him before he went to school. She'd say, have you cleaned your teeth? Yes, mum. Let me smell. Have you washed under your armpits? Yes, mum. She didn't offer to check that out. And I would say to her, you're always on his back. Leave him alone. She would say, no, I need to be. And, and you know, the truth of it is we both needed to learn from each other. I needed to become a little stronger. She needed to choose her battles a bit often because if you're always on someone's back, they never know what really matters to you. And over the years, we learned that from each other. But the fundamental lesson we learned is you have to present the united front. I remember telling me off one day, she'd sent Lloyd to bed early for something and I went up and said, oh, I'm sorry, Lloyd, what's your mother done to you know? Come here, let me give you a hug. And she said, Rob, that's not on. You may not agree with me, but we have to present United Front. And I think she was right. Absolutely vital. We want to speak in this final section about a very important value for us. And that's the difference our shared faith makes in our marriage, including how it affects the way we approach disagreement. Whether or not you share a faith, we hope you'll find some of these principles relevant for you. Often, when there's a lot of tension between us, we need space. And for many people, talking to God provides this. The importance of having a shared faith is fundamental. It, to me, it's been the glue that's held our marriage together. Because when every couple's gonna come across hard times, and when you do come across those rough mm. patches, your shared faith's the only thing that's gonna keep you together because it's gonna offer that common ground and that absolute truth that you guys both can go to. I think one of the biggest differences that our faith makes for us is in what we expect from each other. We've seen how some people, when they get married, put unrealistic expectations onto their husband or wife and onto their marriage. They expect their partner will meet all of their needs, but that's a recipe for disappointment. The wife of astronaut Charlie Duke, who led the Apollo 16 mission to the moon, commented on why their marriage very nearly failed. She said, My marriage to Charlie was another attempt to fill the void. Our marriage failed me because I was looking for him to be the perfect husband in the perfect marriage. That was my Cinderella dream. Expecting our wife or husband to be the ideal partner and to meet all of our needs will cause a marriage to spiral downwards, as in this diagram. Expectations which are not fulfilled lead to us making demands of each other, which then lead to disappointment, because no one human being can meet all these needs. And the disappointment then leads to blame and criticism. We had tried to have another child and we have never been pregnant again. So that was six years ago. I've always wanted to have a large family myself. I always expected that I would have, talk about expectations, that was definitely how I pictured I'd have at least five kids. I'm one of 10. You know, Brad comes from a smaller family, so his expectations were different. I didn't come into things with a, a, a set expectation. There have been times where I've wanted him to do things or not do things to make our chances the best. Like, don't drink that diet soda or yeah. watch that laptop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, um, and sometimes that's frustrating for me because I'm you know, going through all this stuff. I feel like I'm disappointing her, not doing whatever to fulfill what her perceptions or desires were going into everything. Nikki and I both became Christians after going out for nearly two years and a lot changed as a result. I think in retrospect, one reason was that previously I'd been looking to our relationship to meet all of my needs. As I started looking to God instead for those needs, it made a big difference. This next diagram is our attempt to show why. It shows us looking first to God for that unconditional love we all crave, for a sense of significance, security and self-esteem. And then, as those needs are met in God, we find we're able to give more easily to each other. Only God knows every one of my needs, and so that's the first place I go to. If I'm in crisis, if I'm upset, oftentimes I'll just, you know, ask God for help and then be able to talk to Joe about it. It also helps me see Joe in a new light if I'm upset with him. Sometimes, you know, I'll just be thinking about whatever's upsetting me. And it's almost like God says, I adore him. I so love him. This is who he is in my eyes. 
and it just shifts my focus. It's like, yep, that is who Joe is, and, and I love him too, and whatever this negativity is, we can work through it. Nikki and I decided right from the beginning of our marriage that we wanted to pray together as a couple. And we found it's been a great way for us to connect with each other in a meaningful way at the start of each day. We aim at just a few minutes each morning and we simply ask each other, what would you like me to pray for you today? It'll be about very personal things, such as something we're worried about, perhaps a difficult decision we have to make or something to do with one of our children. Sometimes it's been the same request day after day. When our children were little, I was constantly exhausted and I found myself asking Nikki to pray that I might have more energy and more patience. And it made such a difference. We found it really changes our perspective on the day when we focus on God. It was hard to watch your child go through the things that we watched. When we have God in the center of all this, we don't have to have all the answers. When we, you're looking to your spouse to solve your issue, you know, I need you to solve this for me right now. And, and we don't agree on that. There's not a set answer on how you go about this. And everybody's opinions that are coming in all differ. Mm. And we, when we also committed, we, we said we made a commitment that we, before God, that we were going to stick together through this. So just verbalizing that and saying, I love you and we are going to work th through this together. And yeah, having God in the middle of it was huge for us. The difficult thing is there's no guarantee just because we pray and just because we're following what God is guiding us. There's no guarantee that this all ends up well, but we released the outcome to God and just said, we'll, we'll do what you what, what you show us to do. And that was powerful for us. And God was faithful and, and we have a three-year-old grandbaby now and, and uh, everything, is, everything is good. We found that praying together like this on a regular basis has stopped us taking each other for granted or being upset with each other for too long. We usually read a verse or two from the Bible before thanking God for our marriage, our home, our family, or whatever comes to mind. And then we each say a short prayer for the other. Sometimes, before we can pray, we've had to say sorry if one of us knows that we've upset the other. And when we've had a disagreement, these few minutes of prayer have often helped us to see more of each other's point of view. Our major foundation was our faith. We really had to rely on that. Even if we weren't at one accord, we knew we could go into our, what we call our prayer closet and just work it out there. So even though we may not have been in sync, we knew to at least keep that in sync. That's one thing we always promised each other. We've certainly had to persevere with praying together over the years. As with our marriage time, it doesn't just happen. We've had to be deliberate about it and plan it into our schedule. We don't manage it every day, but when we do, we experience the difference in our relationship. Before we end this session, we want to give you the opportunity in the last few minutes to pray for each other if you'd like to, very simply and briefly. What we suggest is that you ask your husband or wife if there's one thing that they're concerned about at the moment. Then, if you're comfortable praying, pray for each other, either aloud or silently, specifically about what they've just told you. If you're not comfortable praying, then we suggest that you express your support for your partner concerning what they've just told you in some other way. We're going to finish this session now with a prayer, so please stay just as you are. A verse in Psalm 46 says this, God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in times of trouble. Thank you, Lord, that you're our strength, particularly in times of difficulty. We ask that when differences between us cause conflict, you would help us to see each other's point of view and to learn to match our strides to one another. 
please help us to appreciate each other more and more and to make changes in ourselves where we need to for the sake of our marriage. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's all for this session. We look forward to seeing you next time when we'll be talking about the power of forgiveness. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>